Kena and Purple uh, involve the varying degrees on the Deep the Ocean project, which somehow stands for the Optical Design Tools for Ocean Energy Arrays. Uh, so I'm going to present the first half, and then Arab's going to present the second half of this presentation. What we're going to look at today, basically just to introduce you to the project, is it's a big project, both in terms of funding, uh, people involved, and also the commitment at Edinburgh, so I think it's, it's quite good for people to know what's happening. I have yet that no one's presented on this yet, so hopefully it's not too dry for anyone. So what we'll cover is basically what is the Deep Deep Ocean project and what we're trying to achieve, uh, who is involved within the project, have a little look at the project structure, some of the, the work that's been done there, and then specifically drill down into what we're doing at Edinburgh. Uh, and we're looking at the electrical architecture of the, the offshore network. Uh, and then at that point, roughly in the middle, I'll pass over to Anup, who will give an example of the methodology and investigate the transmission network performance, the cost characteristics, and how we might basically weigh those off against each other to make a decision on how to build our network. So the project goal is to accelerate the industrial development of ocean energy by providing shared access design tools for wave and tidal energy converter arrays, which is quite a long goal. It's also very ambitious. It covers uh, a lot within that. So to help that happen, the, there's 36 months, so they give us quite a long time to achieve this. We've also thrown 6 million euros, give or take a little bit, at the project to help us do that. The project is led and coordinated by the University of Edinburgh, uh, by Henry Jeffrey, who is a PI, and supported by Laura, uh, Andy, and Sam in the kind of coordination role. So they're all chasing us up for deliverables and making sure that we're working as hard as we can. There's 18 partners. Uh, it covers a mixture of university, utility developers, European research consortiums, and supply chain and trade associations. I must be honest, I'm not sure if I've met all of these people, particularly down in the bottom here, so I'm not 100% sure what they do, but I'm sure Henry, who has just arrived, will be able to, to tell me if I go too far off the course. So from a university or academic viewpoint, we have Edinburgh, obviously, uh, Cork, uh, if you're heavily involved, Exeter and Aalborg University as well. From the utility and developer point of view, we have Iberdrola or Scottish Power Renewables, uh, Bath and Fowl and Derry Blue Energy. From the European research side, we have Technalia, Fraunhofer, Wayback, the Joint European Research Committee or Council, I can't remember that, and not met them. Sandia, Marine Tech, and France Energy Marine. And the supply chain, we have Prismium, who are a, a major cable manufacturer, TTI, who are Tension Technology International, and ITP, who are uh, electrical consultants based in the UK. And then we have this trade association, which is Ocean Energy Europe, which I believe has around 80 members uh, and compromises all the, the main players within the, the ocean energy uh, arena give you an idea of what that looks like geographically. We have 18 partners compromising 12 different countries. Uh, I've checked, everyone's been accounted for, so that whoever did this made a good job of making the figure. And we have Sandia, who are located across in the US, and they have a wealth of experience in the offshore wind uh, industry and development, so they're, they're very good at providing us some kind of a grounding for what we're doing. <coughs> Similarly, the, the industrial partners like Iberdrola or Scottish Power, they are very keen to see what, what comes out of this to help them push some of these things through. So I'm now going to go a little bit onto how the work is structured, so I'm going to try and put on my Henry Jeffrey hat to make this uh, clear and uh, understandable for everyone. I, I may not do as good a job as him. Uh, we'll see how we get on. So the work is divided into eight work packages give or take, uh, and there's four technical work packages uh, who are actually perhaps more involved in the research side of things and trying to cobble this all together. So there's the electrical system architecture, moorings and foundations, life cycle logistics, system control and maintenance, 
and we're looking and investigating these areas across three broad themes. So the themes which are driving the project, obviously the most important one, which is cost, reliability, and also the environmental impacts of the, the designs. So it's very much a whole systems approach design tool, which allows the user to input as much or as little information as they can to get guidance on how to perhaps choose the best options in all these key stages of the ocean energy development. So who's responsible for these? Well, as I hinted at, at Edinburgh, we're responsible for uh, designing the electrical system architecture routines. The University of Exeter are doing the moorings and foundations. Life cycle logistics by Wayback and Fraunhofer are responsible for system control and maintenance scheduling. Similarly, the thematic areas are being controlled uh, and driven by certain organisations. So Wayback are helping with the cost. University of Exeter are driving the reliability concerns and France Energy and Marine are in charge of ensuring that all the designs satisfy the required environmental concerns. Now this is a quite simplified image of the work structure. Uh, in the project meeting there's a lot more arrows than you see here. Uh, the key point is that although there are discrete blocks or work packages as they're referred to here, of course there is natural iteration between some of these things. So when we actually see some pictures of the, the offshore networks, uh, which I'll put up in Anatol, Put up, we'll be able to give some clear idea of where some of these trade offs will occur. So, to give an idea of how the work is structured, <coughs> it is quite a linear flow in that it starts with work package two, which is the array layout. So, that considers basically where these things should go within the, within the sea. So, that's uh, taken care of by University of Albrook, who have extensive experience with that. They will then pass on to the different work packages a grid layout, including some tolerance boundaries of where the ocean energy converters are. And then it's up to us to come up with the, some best examples of the electrical <coughs> system architecture for that given spacing. Similarly, mirrors and foundations have to come up with mirrors and foundations for those coordinates. Lifecycle logistics has to use these two inputs schedule the installation of that and maintenance and control are doing a similar job. Clearly within here there's going to be a lot of iteration and that's where we are at the project. We're about one year in of the 36 months, in fact I think we're almost exactly one year in. Uh, so all the project and problem formulation has more or less been done and we're now at the, the kind of crucial stage of trying to implement some of this. We all have the standard work packages of management and dissemination, which basically help this run along smoothly. A very important one for this is work packet seven, which is being led by Technalio, who are responsible for bringing everything together. So they have to take the code which is prepared and the routines which are prepared by all these work packages and make them work together, come up with a GUI to allow the user to use this tool. So that, that's no small task, they, they are a very big player within the project. To help give some uh, grounding and foundation to the work which is being done here, uh, the, the project with the help from the Strategic Advisory Board has come up with some scenarios to help try and sanity check the decisions which are made within this. So these have been selected to help identify modelling parameters and to aid the work of the package integration. As this is an ocean energy thing, we have to cover wave and tidal, uh, and this has been agreed upon to cover the expected uh, main technologies of both wave and tidal. So for wave, they're categorized by nearshore and offshore, and covering three main technologies of fixed floating point absorber and floating attenuator. For tidal, we have constrained channel and head flow, headland flow, and similarly we have fixed axis and floating turbines as well. The scenario sites which have been selected are in various stages of development and commercialisation. So we have Lewis Wave Power, 
Fairhound Tidal, Shetland Array, West Wave Array, and the Scottish Borough Sign of Isla Array. Now, I'm relatively new to this uh, subject area on the marine side, so I'm sure people are a lot more familiar with these than I am, but you know, I I'm getting there, that's the main thing. Uh, by selecting these scenarios, we cover quite a lot of the expected uh, site specifications which are envisaged in the, in the near future and also in the medium term future. So some of the key characteristics to consider are the total array size. So can we expect to have you know, a gigawatt plant offshore in the short term? That's not going to happen. So we've had to put some sensible boundaries around these things to try and validate with the available data. So the covers array size, water depth for both tidal and wave, different types of seabed conditions, which is obviously of great importance when we're installing cables and putting down moors and foundations. Ratings of devices, what actually doing the job there, the a maximum upper limit of three was set there. Cable distance from offshore to onshore, loadout distance, which is the installation, onshore distance from the cable landing to the onshore substation, and O and M distance, i.e. distance to the port. The scenarios that have been selected were carefully considered and discussed and drew upon the, the experience of all the involved partners and we've been able to cover pretty much all of the expected <coughs> parameters which are coming up uh, and facing wave and tidal developments in the short to medium term. Obviously there's a few exceptions in the more extreme boundaries of these but if no one's building that then we can't validate against it. So that's the general overview of work of the BT Ocean project. I'm going to start drilling into a little bit of work, work packet 3, which is the, the work packs that Edinburgh are doing on the electrical system architecture. And I'll give a, a general overview of that and then pass over to Anna for a bit more technical detail and some more interesting results. So the overall aim of work packet 3 is to provide the algorithms to identify the optimal offshore electrical network as well as a connection and integration into the onshore grid. So to do that we need to be able to compare against all our three uh, thematic areas which are reliability, <coughs> cost and the environmental impacts. So obviously the benefits of the various electrical subsystems need to be quantified against these parameters. Electrical efficiency plays a very big part. Obviously this affects the energy yield and the overall return on investment which the project is going to get. So that basically is one of the, if not the key driver, you know, it's very much up there. Similarly, the reliability will impact upon this, not just as a standalone parameter, but also impacting the amount of energy which can be harnessed and taken back to shore. If we have the cheapest system, the most efficient system, if it's not reliable, then we're still going to miss out on, a, on gaining there. Uh, the cost implications obviously bring those two things together and that's where we get the, the input from the other work packages to make sure that we're getting the best global solution. The environmental impacts are slightly harder to define for the electrical system but we have certain things like EMF around cables and heating, uh, those aspects but at this stage of the project the involvement between the electrical work package and environmental work package or the environmental team leaders has been quite minimal so we, we need to improve that and work out how to do that. Who's involved? Well these are the people that I've had the most contact with. So it's the University of Edinburgh, IT Power, the same as the electrical consultants, uh, University of College Cork, Sandia, Fraunhofer and Prismian, the, the cable manufacturer. Of course we have involvement from all partners and particularly from Wayback and Technalia who are involved in helping us pull everything together. The approach that we've taken within Work Packet 3 is to develop our integrated software platform which compromises a Python code which uh, is compatible with GIS software and a component database. So obviously the component database is the selection of cables, transformers, etc. which Anik will go into a bit more detail on the options there. One of the things which is facing the project at the moment is the, the interaction between different work packages and parts of the decision making process. So we are currently facing this 
decision in the Python side if we try to run Powerflow in real time or if we try to use an expert system where we can decide on the best layout for a given input. But again, that's it's work in progress. So what have I been talking about for the last 10, 15 minutes? Well, we're, we're interested in the network topology, the components within that, uh, and how they impact upon the overall performance of the network. So it can be rather crudely defined with only a few components. So the umbilical subsea connectors, the offshore cable, which defines the offshore network, the collection point, which may be a hub, it may be an offshore substation, the transformer, if we need that or not, depends on the array power and the distance to shore, and that's something that Alex is going to go into a lot more detail on. We then have some cable protection, which we then need to bring into the, <coughs> the uh, maintenance guide as well. The transmission cable back to shore, and then we have options when we land the cable, how that happens. So this hopefully starts to highlight some of the, or the iterative nature between decision-making tools. One of the things we focused on a lot is the seabed conditions and the installation of the cable. So the shortest path, which would give us the shortest distance of cable, which would give us the cheapest cost, may not give us the most uh, low cost installation method, depending on this type of seabed condition. So what we need to try and work out is how we can include to go around a certain seabed condition if it helps minimize the overall cost. Uh, and that's, that's a very crucial thing, I think, to return the overall lowest cost. The network topology is what I'm going to focus on, a slightly technical aspect, just to give you a flavour of some of the options open to us. So the network topology is effectively this part of the system here, where we connect the different devices together before the point of collection back to shore. And its talk is going to focus specifically on this part and then do a very brief comparison between the impact of this and this on the overall efficiency of the system. What you need to appreciate is that this cable is typically a lot longer than this cable, so it has a, a bigger influence, but depending on what we do in between, those effects can be reduced slightly. So within the offshore network, there's a, a range of options, but there's three kind of standard ones from which all other ones stem. The most simple and easiest to control option is a, a radial network. So this is widely used within the offshore wind industry where a lot of the experience for this project comes from as well, from the, the industrial partners. In this topology, we have the grid, we have a transformer, which may or may not be there depending on the distance to shore, and then we have our generators connected in a series string. Now, this is obviously a very simplified diagram, I mean, it's any protection, circuit breakers, etc. But it gives a, an idea, a visualization of the options. The cable rating of each string is determined simply by the number of uh, the marine energy converters in each string and the individual rate, power rating of each device. You sum them up, you get the rating. So it's nice and simple. And the other advantage of this is that the cable can be tapered. Clearly, different sections of this cable need to be rated for different powers. As we move along from here, the power and the opacity required by the cable increases. That can uh, lower cost. The bad thing about this is that there's no redundancy within the network. So if there's a cable fault at this location, until that cable is repaired, we lose the output of this whole chain. One of the easiest ways to, to solve that is to use a single-sided network. Again, exactly the same. All we've done is add this cable from the last converter back to the collection point. That means we now have two paths back. So any cable fault doesn't result in the loss of the whole string. We now have redundancy. The disadvantage of this is that the cable cannot be tapered because this cable has to be sized to carry the whole rating of this. If we had a fault here, then this is a path back. So there's no cable tapering. Another simple alternative is a double-sided ring, in which we simply join the end of two strings together. Again, we now have redundancy, as opposed to in the radial string where we didn't. We were able to use less cable than the single-sided, because effectively we have the redundancy, 
but this cable, rather than being redundant or underutilized, is effectively connected to the string. The disadvantage of this is that we need a larger cable because we're connecting all of these in series. This gives an option, uh, an idea of the options available on the network, but it doesn't tell the whole story. We need to put some kind of numbers behind this. So using a simple example of some of a, uh, five times two megawatt devices connected in series, so we have 10 megawatts per spring, per, uh, sorry, per string, we can check as the turbine output power increases, what happens to the losses caused by each individual converter. What we can see is that the losses increase from radial to double to single, which is slightly, it's, it's an interesting result, and it's due to the, the connection of the extra cables there and the losses within them. The most interesting one is by using the single cable to the radial cable, we basically are, have to, as we say here, the cable cannot be tapered, so we have to use a cable with a larger cross-sectional area. When that happens, the resistance will reduce. So we're able to effectively save on the power uh, losses within that, so it increases the efficiency of the overall system. So this is a standalone part. It doesn't include the cost of the actual cable, which is dependent upon the size and the rating. It doesn't consider reliability or the environmental impact of these. But obviously, the cost, the size of the cable, the weight of the cable impacts upon the installation as well. So this highlights some of the, the iterations which we're going to have to have within the project to make sure that although we can find a local minimum, a local minimum cost, for example, within work packet three for the electrical architecture, it might not result in a global minimum. So there's definitely a trade-off between the different stages of the project. But effectively, that's what we need to solve over the coming months ahead. Uh, so that's the end of my part as a, as a brief introduction to the project uh, and some examples of the offshore network. And I'm going to make a half-time sub with Anna, uh, who's going to focus on the transmission network. all the objectives of the, the particular work package they're involved in within the, the, the whole project. And uh, we're looking at benefits of various electrical subsystems, uh, the electrical efficiency of various configurations and various combination of electrical equipment there. We need to look at reliability, environmental impacts, cost implications. Now the work we've done so far mainly focuses on the electrical efficiency which is measured by essentially the power losses within the electrical configuration and the cost implications. Various, you know, different combination of elements would cost different. Different combinations of, or different configurations of network would, would cost different. So we mainly focus on those two elements at the moment. Now, this figure here is very similar to the, the wave hub figure that Adam showed some time back. You have the, yep. So you have your, your converter, the umbilical, and this bit here is the, the intra-array network, the, you know, the electrical network within the array offshore. The offshore substation here, you can call it the collection point. It need not be an offshore substation, but it's basically collecting all the power that these converters here have generated. You have the, the cable link to the show, and later on, after a bit of uh, you know cable or overhead lines on the land, you have the onshore substation. And by transmission system, I mean anything that comes from here on, you know, from the collection point towards the the offshore substation, uh, the onshore substation. And what are the choices that we have here? So basically, as I mentioned. The first choice we have is over here. We have choice over the, the type of collection point that we use. We could, and I'll speak a bit more about the various options in the next slide. The second option we have there is with respect to the transmission, whether we're going to use AC or DC transmission. 
then we have an option with respect to the transmission voltage that has an effect on the losses it indirectly has an effect on the, the cost assuming that we are using an AC system we have choice over the number of transformers that are there in your offshore substation if it's a DC system it would be probably uh, a choice over the number of converters different ways of connecting into DC systems we also have some choice over the number of cables that connect the collection point to the onshore network the first choice we have there collection point so it could be a, a subsea hub like the one shown here which was in our <coughs> slide as well it's basically just an electrical connector that is under the sea more suited for small farms or, or small arrays of, of devices you know four or five like the one we have down uh, at the Bay Hub test site. More often than not, such, co such collection points are suited for cases where the farm's not too far away from the shore. The second option that we have, it, it, it's, it's an artist's impression here, is a subsea substation with the transformers which get all of that on the seabed. Now we have systems like these within the oil and gas industry but they're all of a much smaller size when compared to the kind of farms we are looking at, you know, megawatt range. So, in the near or in the short to mid term, I don't know whether we would, whether this would be a, a viable alternative for our, our collection point. The third option we have is having a platform and off the substation there as a collection point and We've got these already with the offshore wind farms and in the near to mid term this seems to be the, the most likely option that would be used within marine energy farms. HPDC, HPDC, and then we can, we can keep debating this. Uh, again, in the short to mid term, considering the sizes of farms we are we are considering in this project and the distance from the shore. The size of the farm we are going up to 100 megawatts. Distance from the shore up to 50 kilometers. For this combination, at least right now, FTDC is not cost efficient when compared to HP, uh, AC transmission. So again, we are doing a, uh, we are making a choice there. So we are sticking with HPAC, and we will be considering FTDC later on in the project as an enabling technology because 10 years, 20 years down the line with the cost of switches and converters coming down, HVDC might become a more cost efficient choice. So now since we have selected an AC transmission system bringing the power to the shore, we have choice over the voltage level at which the transmission happens. And again, the voltage level, you know, for a, a farm of a particular power rating, the higher the voltage, <coughs> the lower the currents would be, the lower the currents, the lower the losses would be. So that's where the voltage comes into play. And it, it, it depends on how far the farm is from the coast and how big the farm is. In the UK present, we have the we have networks at these voltage levels, 400, 275, 132, 33, and 11 kV. Uh, considering that you're only looking at farms up to a 100 MVA rate farm, it's likely that we would be, and also considering that we're only looking at say 50 kilometers of transmission distance, it's likely that we'd be only seeing these three voltage levels, 132, 33, and 11 kV. Uh, number of transformers, number of subsea cables. Now the question there is more about reliability. You know, what happens if a transformer in the substation fails? So do we just switch the whole farm off or will we still have some capacity to transfer at least some of the power back to the shore? So it's more a question of reliability. Now, there has been some work in the offshore wind industry that has done a, a cost-benefit analysis for exactly the same thing, you know, the number of transformers to have on the substation and the number of links back to the shore that are required. And for farms, 
up to about 500 megawatts, you know, that's the kind of size of offshore wind farms you're seeing these days. And they suggested, you know, they did all the, the rants, and they suggested that it's best to go with no redundancy if possible. And the reasons they cite there were, uh, you know, the, the low load factor, you know, the capacity factor of wind is close to like 30 or 40 percent, which doesn't justify having the additional cost of putting up transformers or additional cables to the shore. Now, they also said another thing, which was if the farm was, I think, greater than, the size of the farm was greater than 90 megawatts, then you can, then you would need to have two transformers. Now, we're only looking at marine, you know, wave and tidal farms up to 100 megawatts, that means, you know, we're just in the border there. So again, that's something we can choose, we can have two transformers, but we would need to put in costs and see whether that will make an economical, uh, an economic sense to do that. <coughs> so, we spoke about choices, so these are the, the choices, the decisions we have made to start with, and we're going to compare the various options from within this list. So we've decided that, okay, it's good, the collection point is going to be a, an offshore substation, a platform like we see in, offshore wind, uh, in the offshore wind industry. It is going to be an AC transmission system that transmits the power from the offshore substation to the shore. We're considering three voltage levels right now, 11, 33, 132 kV. We have kept this open still. Like we can have an offshore substation with just one or two transformers. Similarly, we can have either one cable to the show or two. And this figure just shows you the, the, the various of this the transformer, the platform, two cables, three alternatives that are there. And the, the efficiency, the, the losses calculation, we've mainly selected a, a subset of all the scenarios that are meant to be covered within the DT Ocean project. The losses, essentially are dependent on the size of the farm and the distance of the farm from the shore. So we've you know, kind of covered the entire range of the distance and size of farm. Device, so we needed, we needed the power rating or the, you know, the power characteristic of some device to start with. So we just chose the, the Thalamus T1 device, you know, their, their power matrix is available, and it's been published and available. Right? easy thing to do. So we just start there. And uh, why, have, why I have highlighted that is because you know, we needed uh, a representation of the electrical network and we've done some work with the network uh, in, in Lewis. So we had impedances, system impedances from that site which we could use in the modeling work. Methodology, uh, we needed data of, you know, so we've selected a wave device there, a Pelamis wave energy converter. So we needed a time series of, over here basically it's significant wave height and the, the mean zero crossing wave period over, and we took it over 15 years. And this is just a, a scatter plot, basically a, a, a scatter plot, basically shows how many times a particular sea state has happened over the 15 year period. So that's the first part of the input that we needed. That's the power matrix of the, the Pelamis device, which shows the average power generated by one device for different significant wave height ranges and periods. So this average power, this one device, we, we're talking about the arrays, we not, we not considered hydrodynamic interactions, which you know, it's, it's going to be input from another work package. And for the transmission system bit, what we have what we have assumed is that the power that is generated is okay. So this is the this is the offshore platform, the transformer. It could be the one or two, and the cable back to the show, the system impedance here, and the rest of the the network here. So we've got the power output, the average power generated for all the C states from the power matrix. We do a power flow in MATLAB for all, all of the C states 
we get, we, we identify what the losses are for all of this average power losses for all of the C states. And we know what the occurrence of each C state is. From this categorizing, multiply the two, you get, and add them all up, you get the, the energy losses in watt hours, or yeah, in watt hours, like. So this is basically, the first figure here shows if my transmission voltage was at 11 kV for a range of farm sizes and a range of distances from the shore, what the percentage energy lost is just in the transmission, you know, from the substation onto the shore. And uh, most of the, like, some of the things are very, very obvious, you know, bigger the size of the farm, further away from the shore it is, more the losses are. And know that you know, we can only go up to 9 megawatts or 10 megawatts in the case of the 11 kV uh, transition because of, you know, you don't have cables of a higher power rating than this in, for that particular voltage level. And you know, if you take the case of the uh, 6 megawatt farm, 20, 25 kilometers from the shore, around 10% of the energy that's produced is lost is in the transmission network. Now if you push up the voltage to 33 kV, the transmission uh, voltage, and we take you know, say the, the 10 megawatt farm, 25 kilometers, you can see the, the voltage, the loss, the percentage loss is less when compared to 11 kV, which is because you know, for, the same, for the same farm size, a higher voltage means lower current, lower losses. And even, you know, we can go up to 45 megawatts with the, the 33 kV transmission system. And, you know, the, the energy, the percentage of energy loss has come down quite significantly from, I mean, you can't compare these two, but yeah, it's come down. It, it's, it's a different range altogether. It's all less than 10 percent, you can see there. Now, if you go one step further, and with a 132 kV transmission system, you can go up to the, you can have the entire range now, up to 100 megawatts, and even, so having a 100 megawatt wave farm located 50 kilometers offshore, the percentage energy lost is less than 2%, you know, 1.37 percent there, which, and, and, and this, this one here shows you what the actual losses are in, in gigawatt hours, it's, you know, about 45 gigawatt hours. Now, yeah, so, Basically, the losses are coming down with the voltage level going up. Now, to put this in, put this number into context, if you consider the the levelized cost of energy that is attributed to wave energy right now, it's in the range of 200 to 250 pounds per megawatt hour. So, the figure here would cost something like 10 to 15 million pounds over the, the entire 15-year period. Now, to most of us, that's a big amount of money, but you know, it's only for 1.37 percentage of what the wave developer gets over the entire period. Now we've just we've got some cost models and cost details, cost data from the offshore wind industry, and since the electrical equipment as such, you know, the transformers, cables, they don't change between offshore wind and uh, marine farms. We've done a, a cost, a relative cost table sort of thing, 11 kV, 33 kV, 133 kV. All these costs are relative to a 1 megawatt farm, 10 km off the shore, using 11 kV transmission systems. So that's, that's why this is one year. Now, uh, if you take it, Take an example, say here. If you have a six megawatt farm that is 25 kilometers off from the shore, it would cost you double what this would have cost. And the interesting thing is, even with the 132 kV transmission system for the 100 megawatt farm, 50 kilometers off the shore, the, dis uh, the, the cost of the transmission system as such has not increased that significantly. You know, it's one here, it's about 8.5 here, 
which essentially means that your platform, your cables have changed, number of transformers readings have changed, but the cost of the entire system hasn't changed that much. And some of the costs we've used, you know, we've, we've valued some of it with uh, some of the cost models that we've used, we've valued it with some data that we could get off offshore wind. But you know, there, is, there are some things that we've assumed here, like for example, the installation costs could be very different based on what the seabed's like, but we just assume that it's going to be the same for all types of seabeds. Good for a start, at least. Now, if we leave, okay, so that's the transmission system. Now, we're getting back to the, the network within the array. We have choices there. So, we've just taken this, this one simple case of a, a 10 megawatt, a 9.75 megawatt pump that's, I think, 13 Philanus devices, each rated at you know, 70 kilowatt. And we've, we've compared two intra array networks. One is a, a radial, just one radial, no redundancy. The second is, okay. The number of parameters here aren't correct. So it's, it's just 13 devices, and we have got three radials here. So it's basically one radial versus three radials. How does that change? Everything else remains the same the size and rating and all of that. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the losses within this network with the total losses, including the transmission losses there. And what we find is, you know, for short distances, 10, 15, 20 kilometers, the kind of network you have here does play a significant role when you're looking at losses alone. You know, for the single radial, it's much higher when compared to the three radial network. But as you move away from the shore, like 50 kilometers away, the, the contribution of this, this array the array network is very less when compared to the transmission uh, system, you know, the, the offshore substation to the onshore substation link. Which again, I think it's, it is, and this holds for just that one array, 10 megawatt, 9.7 megawatt size, 13 devices. Things could be very different if it's a larger array, larger number of devices, but yeah, that's something we're working on currently. So that's where we are right now, and some of the work that we are yet to do. So basically, we, we looked at losses, which are a cost to the wave developer or your, your material farm <coughs> developer. We've looked at the actual equipment and installation costs, which are again costs to them. But we haven't looked at the liability of all this equipment. That could be failure rates, they have failure rates, that could be failures, they, they would take some time to repair, which is again all loss of energy because you're not able to transmit the power that's being generated and we've not included preventive corrective maintenance costs yet so we, we, we have to give that information from some of the project partners the cost modeling it's what we've done so far is good to compare i don't know how the absolute cost would actually stand a test so to get rid of some of the, the uncertainty there, we might need to do, or we will need to do some sort of a sensitivity, sensitivity analysis, see how the change of, say, inflation cost of a platform by, say, X person changes the, the, then, the whole cost of the system. We've used a very limited database, you know, Electrical parameters of cables, transformers, and other equipment. Now, we need to expand that, for which we are going to, I think, heavily depend on some of the industry partners within the project. As again, as I said, the internet, in the last thing that I showed before this uh, intraday network, we just looked at, we just, uh, we've just ana analyzed that for a uh, 10 megawatt farm, two different network configuration. We need to do it for a a range of different farm sizes. I mentioned this earlier, we have not thought about FEDC as being a viable option in the next 10-15 years, but we would surely need to consider FEDC as an emerging technology and see 
how and when they might become uh, a viable option for us. Again, we need we work on a very limited uh, a database of cost models and cost data, which needs to be expanded. Again, into some other project partners and for that. So that's all uh, we have right now. Uh, <laughs> and thanks for your time and attention. Any questions to both of us, we are very willing to take them. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.